Adam Lanza shot his way into Sandy Hook Elementary School, somewhere in the forest there behind me, just as the children were getting ready for class at 9.30 in the morning, just after they had said their Pledge of Allegiance. He was wearing combat gear. He was armed with two handguns, the kind of handguns used by soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. And police say that they found enough evidence in the house of his mother, who he had killed before he came to school, to give us a complete picture of the motives behind this horrendous crime. In theory, the small town of Sandy Hook is America at its best. Safe, reassuring, predictable. A tiny community gearing up for Christmas where no one can remember the last crime committed. Now Sandy Hook has filled up with alien presences, the media, the police, and of course the inexplicable horror that descended on this community yesterday morning. The shooter may be dead, but his actions haunt everything and everyone here. We met Marianne Jacob, the assistant librarian at the school. She was there when it happened. Um, we were just getting our day started and we had a fourth grade class in the room and um, the intercom came on as if they were gonna make an announcement and there was some, conf you could hear some confusion in the office and I actually thought one of them had hit the button by themselves by accident and so I called the office to say hey the intercom's on and Barbara who's one of the secretaries said there's a shooter so I hung up and I yelled to our group to lock down the room because we have a process for that and I ran across the hall and yelled to the two classrooms across the hall and slammed their doors and we came back in and locked all our doors and, and then we discovered that um, and then we started hearing shooting you could hear it it was like bang 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 and and it would stop and it would start again. And um, How many children did you have with you? We had 18 kids with us, a fourth grade class. So, you know, they were like, is this a drill? What's going on? And we just said, hey, we don't know. We have a routine. We're going we're gonna to do what we're supposed to do and we'll wait and see what happens. And um, they sat quietly. They were so good. And um, I think they were a little scared. Um, and and then we discovered do? one of our, our doors was unlocked. Um, I actually saw what turned out to be a policeman's gun come around the corner of the of bookcase and he looked in and he you know told us to be quiet and when we realized the door wasn't locked we crawled across the room into through the kitchen into a little storage room and we um, locked the doors and barricaded it with some file cabinets and uh, there happened to be some coloring stuff and crayons in the room so we set the kids all up with paper and crayons and they all um, started coloring and drawing pictures and um, one of the guys who works with us, um, there was a bunch of stuffed animals in a bag and um, he took them out and the kids cozied up with the stuffed animals and we waited for, we waited and listening to the shots and when um, the police finally came we, we were afraid to open the door so um, one of them put his uh, badge under the door and then they called us on the phone too to say it's okay, it's the police, you can open the door. And, it's really sad. There's, you know, every family in Newtown either knows somebody or has somebody who died, and it's just really. This is sad. a really small, incredibly safe, and tightly knit community. It I mean, is. It's unimaginable, isn't it? It's unimaginable anywhere. Anywhere. I mean, it's an awful thing, and there's. This is hard to believe that we're in the middle of all this. Do you think this community will heal? Will it come out of this? We have to. We have a lot of kids left, and a lot of families who um, need our support, and we have to. She and so many other teachers are the heroes of this horror story. I told them to be quiet. I told them we had to be absolutely quiet um, because I was just so afraid that if he did come in and then he would hear us and then he would maybe just start shooting the door. So I said, no, we just have to be absolutely quiet. Um, and we have, I said, there are bad guys out there now. We need to wait for the good guys. They're coming again. This is the road where the killer lived with his mother, affluent American suburbia. Apparently, he shot her first before going to the school. He used the three guns she owned. Adam Lanza, 20 years old, brilliant at maths, painfully shy, a loner who became a mass murderer. How often have we heard that line after a mass shooting? The police told us that all the clues to the crime and to the motive were found in the dead mother's house. The nation is in shock, and for the first time, a president, yeah, often accused of being too Moore economical with his emotions, found more tears than words. The majority of those who died today were children. Uh, beautiful little kids between the ages of five and 10 years old.
They had their entire lives ahead of them. Birthdays, graduations, weddings, kids of their own. Back in Sandy Hook, they've embarked on the searing business of grieving and healing. This is the St. Rose Catholic Church. Seven of the dead children went to Sunday school here. The Christmas manger is a heartbreaking reminder of innocence lost to slaughter. Sandy Hook, another small town in America, immortalized for all the wrong reasons. There was a particularly chilling image earlier in the day when the refrigerated mobile mortuary truck, which had been sent up from New York, was seen leaving the premises of the school, presumably with the bodies of the dead on board. Now, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of journalists here from all over the world, from around the country, trying to find out every new morsel of information. The police clearly knows a lot, but they're not telling us yet. And they also know the names of the victims, and they haven't publicized that either. But this is what Lieutenant Paul Vance of the Connecticut State Police did say earlier in the day. Listen. Detectives will, will certainly analyze everything and put a complete picture together of, of the evidence that they, that they did obtain. Um, and we're hopeful, we're hopeful that it'll, it'll paint a complete picture as yeah. to how and why this entire incident, uh, unfortunate incident occurred. And that was Lieutenant Paul Vance from the Connecticut State Police there. Now, the president said yesterday very clearly that there has to be some meaningful action about gun control, despite the political differences between Democrats and Republicans in Washington, to ensure that this sort of thing never, ever happens again. And to be honest, I've been here in this country for 10 years. I've heard other presidents say this, and every time it is said, very little happens. So is this now the red line that has been crossed that will finally galvanize this country and its political class into doing something about gun violence and gun control? Here's Victoria McDonald. The debate over guns is back. This is not a simplistic problem. It isn't solved easily. Within hours of yesterday's shooting, the inevitable week, discussion over gun control had begun. Are we just, is this just okay? Is this just all right that 100,000 people a year have bullets go through their body? And with the flag over the White House at half-mast, President Obama himself has raised the issue. So we have to come together, and we're going to have to take meaningful action to prevent more tragedies like this from happening. But will anything really change? Is the massacre of young children a shooting too far even for the pro-gun lobby? Recent history at least says not. They once feared President Obama. Shortly before his 2009 election, the shelves of gun shops were emptied because they thought he would tighten the laws. Yet after the Aurora cinema shooting, he said nothing. He has not ever made gun control legislation of any sort a political priority. Neither is it a priority for anyone in Congress. If you think about the 1960s, politicians were being shot left, right and centre. President Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, more recently Gabby Gifford. Even when politicians are the target, politicians will not put their necks out and try to end handgun control access or assault weapons uh, access. The last legislation of any significance was in the 1990s. President Clinton signed the acts introducing background checks on people buying guns and a ban on some semi-automatic firearms and on magazines holding more than 10 rounds. And following the Columbine High School massacre, he once again called for tighter controls. We must strengthen our gun laws and enforce those already on the books better. Yet that semi-automatic firearms ban expired in 2004 under George W. Bush. And even following the Virginia Tech shooting in 2007 when 32 people were killed, President Bush evaded the question. Uh, you know, on the gun control debate, and there's inevitably going to be a debate, as there should be after an incident like this, uh, you know, I, I, I think now, my, my own view is, is that I haven't had time to reflect, nor do I know all the facts on what took place. I do know now's the time to help heal these hearts. But any debate in America always comes back to the Constitution and the right to bear arms. And behind every debate is the National Rifle Association, a gun lobby so powerful they make and destroy political careers. Outside the White House yesterday, a crowd gathered. Today is the day, they said. But many will believe that is just wishful thinking. 
Now, I will leave you for now with one small irony. The gun laws here in the state of Connecticut are some of the toughest in America. We know that Adam Lanza, 20 years old, could never have purchased those guns in a gun shop by himself. He had to have taken them off his mother. But this still beggars the question why his mother, Nancy, needed three weapons, including a semi-automatic Bushmaster rifle. Now, we've been discussing all of this uh, later in the program, and of course, we'll be covering the events here in the next few days. And let me just trail ahead to a dispatcher special, the American School Massacre, which I'll be reporting on Monday night at 8 p.m. after the news. Back to Sarah in London with all of today's news. Sarah. Thanks, Matt.